Great. So um, apologies for the technical snafus. For those who've had a little bit of trouble getting in, not quite sure what's going on. I have a feeling it's a Zoom problem. I think we configured things as usual, but so it goes. Um, we will wait a little bit here before we get started. But in the meantime, I will uh, like to give you a look at the semester schedule for spring. We have a, a, a pretty fun and, and um, broad set of presentations. Um, as has been a recent tradition, we have a couple of presentations from CC faculty, early career and, and well-established career, uh, as well as presentations by postdocs and students, a uh, variety of visitors from outside. Uh, Fran Baganel is coming for her follow-up visit. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it's going to be virtual again, but this time she's gonna talk about um, uh, the Juno mission to Jupiter. Uh, we have two uh, presentations being given by visitors who are coming uh, from uh, professional societies, uh, sort of um, uh, featured talks by professional societies, sponsored by professional societies. Uh, next week, uh, Cam Macris uh, is coming to give a talk sponsored by the Mineralogical Society of America. Uh, and it actually, in fact, happens to be the Peter Busick uh, lecture, I believe it's called. It's, it's, and Peter may tell us a little bit about how that happened um, next week. Uh, a variety of other presentations, a um, uh, couple to point out is one on geoscience education by Nicole Ledoux um, in March, and another one in March by Brent Sherwood, who used to be at JPL. Many of us knew him there when he was doing various sorts of managerial things there around space mission architectures, um, and he's now at Blue Origin um, in a very high-level role there. So as some of you know, ASU has a collaboration with Blue Origin around building a private space station, the Orbital Reef. So I think we'll hear quite a bit about that from, uh, from Brent when he's here. Um, so uh, hope you will attend these. As we mentioned also um, uh, in the email, but I'll just reiterate it, we're going to be kind of dynamic in how we're doing things this year, um, this semester. Uh, talks that are coming in by Zoom, we will just do fully by Zoom. We won't bother trying to have people in Marston. The attendance was so low for those presentations, it wasn't really worth the staff time for Rick to fire things up and all that. So, um, so, um, so those presentations, we'll make sure you're aware are fully Zoom, but when we have visitors in person, we will encourage folks to come in person to Marston Theater. Uh, one other announcement, uh, CC Community Conversation next week, next Thursday at noon. Is that right, Minnie? That's um, so uh, please come to that. Minnie may give us a little preview of that in just a second, um, but it should be um, uh, yeah, very informative. Um, so, and please, uh, so if people are getting in, they're having to put in their code. I can see that a lot of people, um, I would send a note around the CC listserv, but we know that's kind of slow. So if you have, if you can look at the attendee list, if you see people who you know wanted to be here and aren't on the attendee list um, and can shoot them a note with the, telling them that they should just enter in the code number, um, that would be appreciated so that we get a good turnout. Um, but it's already pretty good. We got 50 people here. So I think we'll get started. Um, and uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Vernon Morris to kick this off. So I'm gonna turn this over to Minnie to give a formal introduction of our, of our speaker. Well, thanks so much, Ariel, and um, happy new year to everybody and happy new semester. Um, so great that everybody can make it. We're, as Ariel said, uh, gonna try to do it remotely for our speakers that are gonna be here remotely and, and hopefully uh, in, a, in a few weeks time here as we progress towards um, hopefully lesser um, surging in the Omicron, <laughs> we'll hopefully start to also uh, transition to having uh, people actually come in to visit in person and and and, and have some hybrid mode uh, presentations as well. Um, so I want to just say, if, you know, just to start out, I really, um, it's my great, great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce today Professor Vernon Morris, who is our speaker for our very first colloquium of the semester. Uh, Professor Morris, he's a director of the School of Mathematical and Natural Sciences of ASU's new college on ASU's West Campus. And he actually moved to ASU right in the midst of the pandemic, um, July of 2020, I believe is when, when he came here. And um, um, before that though, he, before he came here to ASU, he was professor in the Department of Chemistry and director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at Howard University, where he was for many years. And while he was at Howard, he actually founded the PhD degree granting program in atmospheric sciences, uh, which is the very first one of its kind at any minority serving institution. So um, Dr. Morris's uh, current research is, actually focuses on the chemical evolution of atmospheric particulate 
uh, during transport and residence in the lower troposphere and the implications that it has for aerobiology, which I, I love that term, uh, as well as climate and, and cloud processes. Uh, he's actually served as also the chief scientist for 13 uh, transatlantic science expeditions called the aerosols and ocean science expeditions. And we can look forward to, to hearing a little bit more about that uh, uh, today. Uh, besides being uh, an acclaimed researcher in his field, he's also been a real leader and advocate for advancing equity and uh, inclusion in the geosciences, uh, which we know is, is one of the least diverse uh, fields among the STEM fields. And so in this regard, um, I'll point out that, uh, you know, since having come to ASU, he's uh, served on the executive committee uh, of the LIFT initiative, and LIFT here stands for uh, Listen, Invest, Facilitate, and Teach. Uh, this is a president's initiative that was announced um, a, a year, or just over a year ago now at this point. But the goal is to bring about meaningful change in the racial climate and culture at ASU, and more broadly to advance social justice in society. And so, He's particularly helped to uh, design and launch the ASU Presidential Postdoctoral Program and the Graduate Scholars Program. And these are two of the LIFT initiatives that are designed to produce and recruit and retain Black and other minoritized faculty in the academy. So really doing some incredible, incredible work here uh, at ASU. Uh, and so I'm thrilled uh, that Dr. Vernon Morris is here today to talk on a topic that combines his research and his commitment to promoting equity and inclusion. So welcome, Vernon. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Thank you, Manny. Um, yeah. Let me get back to sharing the screen. Thanks uh, for having me. Um, I believe this is it. I'm confused at which uh, screen I have. Is that the right one? That's it. OK. Um, yeah, thanks um, for um, inviting me uh, to give the uh, colloquium. I wasn't sure that it was the first. Ariel and I had been talking about what um, sort of content to have for a little while. And so that's kind of the reason why I have such a long and unwieldy title. Um, talk about the research or talk about uh, sort of mentoring or talk about some of the science equity advocacy. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's all the same for me. It's not that I separate those out or reduce those to separate parts of my sort of workload. It's, it, I try to do it at the same time so that um, equity is sort of woven through. And so what I hope to do today is talk about a particular project that is near and dear to my heart, um, but also um, describe how we've woven into that research uh, enterprise and, and expeditions, um, inclusive mentoring and uh, equity and hopefully translational impact from some of the outcomes. So I wanna start um, by providing some context um, for where I, uh, for where I sit sort of uh, situationally. Um, and I'll start um, giving sort of a context within which I perform science, which I perform uh, teaching or my job as a scientist. And I call to your attention uh, a book that was written a little over a hundred years ago by W.B. Du Bois um, called The Souls of Black Folk. And there is a huge industry in books on racial equity and how to get along and different things. But I find that this book is still one of the best books um, around that talks about the manifestation of the color line, um, how it affects both parties on any side of a color line. He focused on black folks, of course, but um, this concept of double consciousness, I think, um, is something that is relevant for anyone who is part of a marginalized or excluded group um, based on visible cues that might elicit stereotyping or discrimination or bias. Um, and one of the quotes he has uh, talks about the color line as a veil and that you're uh, as a black person on one side of the veil and on the other side, 
are those that might be conceptually white who can only see you lens or distorted by that veil. Um, and that veil um, creates the concept of a problem. So it asks, how does it feel to be a problem? And you know, this double consciousness, this concept that he evokes that has to do with uh, a simultaneous understanding of who you are as you look outwards towards society and uh, who society thinks you are and the discontinuity between those two things and having to navigate that at all times. And that uh, is this double consciousness that he talks about. And it leads to a number of things that are here, false expectations really on both sides of the veil, uh, performative responses on both sides of the veil, oppositional responses and counter stereotypical behavior. If you expect one thing, you see something else, you try to force it back into the box that you expect and, and that can cause um, problems uh, in engagement. And I think geosciences suffers from all of these, but I bring this up to sort of contextualize how I uh, am situated. And, and a couple of things have happened since 2020. I've started, a, I've led a call to action called No Time for Silence and also published a commentary in um, AGU Advances and I provide the, the citation for that. Not so much because it's my entire life story, but it is a snapshot in my professional experience. Um, it is something that, um, as I said, contextualizes how I view the geosciences. And it was less inspired by uh, George Floyd, as a lot of this political moment appears to be, than by sort of a weariness of the memory of all of the people who have been killed uh, for as many years as I can remember. And just to um, sort of situate that existential threat that this is, uh, in 2021, there were only 15 days when police did not kill someone. Or over 50% of the other 350 days, police killed at least three people, 98% per percent of which uh, led to no charge uh, being filed against officer or department. So no one was held accountable. And in many places, in many metropolitan areas, you have an order of magnitude greater possibility of being killed as a black man than in any other group. So this is not a distant problem for me when I see it in the news. Uh, and I combine that with my being arrested as a graduate student postdoc three times and ending up in jail for nothing that I did. That is the context in which I do science. Um, and so, I'm gonna to jump to the science now, but I wanna sort of ground things in you know, my bandwidth, my mental bandwidth has to take into account um, you know, real life uh, things that have nothing to do with the science that I'd like to focus on. And it's part of uh, a struggle that I think as a community, not just geoscience, is really the STEM community and, and greater society, um, has begun to conceptualize, but not yet deal with fully. And so I'm, I'm glad to hear about the conversations going on in CC and some of the, across um, uh, ASU, uh, the LIFT initiative, which I, I think I understand that uh, CC is one, two of the proposals to bring in some um, BIPOC postdocs and graduate students. And I think it's a great um, start. It should not be limited to those programs, but it's certainly a great start. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to round up this presentation with some thoughts on, on mentoring and inclusion. But I'm gonna start off talking about uh, some things that I really love, which are um, atmospheric aerosols. And then I'll talk about the campaigns a little bit, some research outcomes, and then try to fold in um, inclusion and equity uh, as a consistent part of those research campaigns. So a little bit about atmospheric particulate, um, just some basic, uh, definitions and descriptions that we tend to many times see aerosols and atmospheric particulate used interchangeably. Um, what we're talking about or what I'll be talking about when I refer one of those terms is any particle, typically heterogeneous particle, which means it's a multiple phases in that particle, liquid and solid, 
and it's been in the atmosphere for long amounts of time. And so it can be represented by different types, different chemistries, uh, different compositions, uh, different sizes, um, different shape functions, uh, so that it stays in the atmosphere longer, different uh, biologies or microbiologies, uh, different sources, um, injection at different uh, regions of the atmosphere. And what makes them very challenging and very interesting is that because they're heterogeneous, they can have both a surface chemistry and a bulk chemistry, a chemi an internal chemistry that are happening simultaneously and sometimes uncoupled. And understanding um, how these evolve through the atmosphere and respond to their environment or changes in their environment, um, which respond to changes in radiative uh, fluence um, is uh, a critical part of us understanding air quality of atmospheric chemistry, of climate, uh, of atmospheric exchange with uh, the ocean, with the surface, uh, with health. And so I'm gonna focus on uh, mineral dust aerosol as a specific type of atmospheric particulate. Um, for a number of reasons, a couple of personal reasons, as, as well as just practical reasons, but uh, dust sources um, actually constitute a global circuit. There's always dust moving around the atmosphere. And the Saharan Desert tends to be the largest uh, global source. And many times the, the dust is moving from uh, or across the coast of West Africa, um, southward towards South America, sometimes across the Caribbean, many times into the Eastern seaboard. Um, but sometimes it can go back up into Europe, uh, back into the Middle East. But if you look at the, the sort of cartoon on the left-hand side, you constantly got dust circulating. And what this doesn't show is that dust all often moves to the poles as well. Um, but you have this component of the atmosphere, and I forgot to activate my movie. I think the movie will will play. Well, it didn't, didn't quite play, but I uh, will try to play the movie and you can see that it's not just moving across the tropical Atlantic and subtropical Atlantic and, and landing, uh, so to speak, in the Caribbean, but it can move uh, across the Gulf of Mexico in the Pacific Ocean along the coast, the entire eastern seaboard, uh, and in, really into the central U.S. And so the presence and intensity of dust storms has been increasing uh, actually recently. And in a lot of climate models, it's not treated as the dynamic component of the atmosphere that it actually is, not its chemical evolution, its microphysical evolution. It's really um, treated sort of as uh, an impediment to radiative fluence and an energy balance. Um, but it's chemical processing and physical processing actually change that uh, over time uh, and in space. And this is one of the things that we set out to try to characterize and improve uh, in some of the NOAA's weather and climate models. But just conceptually, uh, beyond the physics of the aerosol, um, we also thought, okay, um, the aerosol is probably chemically reacting as well. And this came out of some earlier studies, really around 2000, 2001, where we were uh, sailing around Puerto Rico during dust season in the summer and measuring chemical properties on the eastern side, the upwind side of uh, Puerto Rico, and then also measuring on the downwind side and finding in the same air mass, and ostensibly the same dust storm uh, evolved Particulate. And we didn't know if that was just coming because it had moved through the Puerto Rican air shed or not. Um, but you also saw evolved aerosol south of Puerto Rico, but also west. It hadn't passed over uh, the island, so to speak. And so we started saying, well, what, what could happen if this were, were reactive aerosol and not just chemically inert aerosol that was moving through uh, uh, the lower atmosphere and ultimately depositing in uh, Puerto Rico. And so we conceived of this model and said, we'll test and see how much of this we can pull out. Um, but it's going to require us to do something different um, than having 
uh, receptor sites, uh, which have been long-term in Barbados, in Azores, uh, in Bermuda, uh, some in uh, the Virgin Islands as well, because those aren't giving us information about the evolution. And so the, the concept of doing cruises across the tropical Atlantic really had to do with trying to classify in the remote ocean what the chemistry of these aerosols were. Now, in general, aerosols uh, and particulate have a lot of different impacts, and certainly dust particulate um, have those impacts from sort of local scale uh, to global scale. Uh, and this slide shows a number of those things um, from catalytic surfaces uh, to vehicles of uh, vehicles for pathogen transport. Um, they modulate uh, tropical cyclone intensity uh, and hurricane intensity. Uh, depending on where they intersect with the system and when they intersect with the system as it's developing. They can be a source of limiting nutrients to the open ocean, um, obviously uh, affect uh, radiances uh, and thus satellite signals. And in fact, the satellite validation component of this, as you'll see, has, has been a major component. It's really been a, a driver for uh, a lot of the funding to sustain the long-term uh, efforts uh, as well as uh, help us understand how we might impact uh, models uh, and, and new satellite products. Uh, and also affect clouds and cloud properties, on, again, across scales. And I see that I misspelled particulate, that should be particulate, not whatever that word is. Um, and so just speaking about aerosols and clouds, this is one uh, of a number of serendipitous experiments that we were able to do because we were sailing out in the ocean during dust storms evolving or uh, emanating from West Africa um, and being able to take advantage of satellite overpasses in a unique way. And so this particular paper happened um, at the time of the image that you see here on the right-hand side, this wispy sort of uh, lighter colored ring um, uh, that appears to mimic the shape of uh, West Africa is partially dust, and so it's predominantly dust, but it's also a mixture of some biomass smoke. But from satellite, it all looks the same. Um, unique thing was, when we were out here, we were actually, uh, by the time of this particular image, sailing um, right underneath this cloud deck. And so we were actually able to take measurements, profiling measurements, from the surface through this cloud deck that was partially impacted by dust and biomass fires, um, but partially dust free, at the same time that we had a satellite overpass of a uh, radar, precipitation radar. And so the, uh, the figures that you see on the, the colored figures that you see on the left hand side are um, DS, the dusty sector, and DF, the dust free sector of those that cloud system, and looking at the different types of clouds uh, in that system, uh, and then uh, the uh, reflectivity, the echoes uh, from the radar of the different clouds, and illustrating that when the cloud is, is being affected by dust, you actually have an amplification of ice nuclei uh, in that cloud. Uh, reduced precipitation, but higher ice nuclei for your stratiform clouds, um, and then in the convective clouds, a little bit of the opposite. You see a lot more intensity, the brighter orange or red colors, higher in the cloud in the dust-free convective clouds, but higher in the cloud in the dusty stratiform clouds. So it's really sort of inverting uh, ice nuclei um, distributions in the clouds, in different clouds in different ways. And this can have uh, significant impact on the precipitation properties in this one of the impacts of clouds that you can um, sort of verify if you're in situ. Tougher to verify if you are um, only looking at it by, by satellite. Um, and so the number of questions that uh, show a little bit earlier, what is the dust doing across different scales? How is it evolving uh, over transport? Um, what are the impacts in the very sensitive climate zone of the, of the tropics? Um, those were questions that we thought we could answer by proposing uh, a field campaign that would sample specifically in the remote ocean. 
and those are the Air, Eros uh, campaigns. Um, we had to take into account the climatology of the dust transport uh, in doing this. And so uh, the two primary dust seasons where it's when the dust is moving across the Atlantic Ocean tend to be summertime, uh, June through August, and then there's a March uh, peak um, that quickly falls off, uh, have a sort of a nadir uh, in April, and then it starts to build back up for the summer and peaks in June, July. Uh, in March, or uh, the spring, um, it's moving a little bit more to the south, and in the summer, it's moving a little bit more displaced, a little bit more to the north, and those are the um, AVHRs, the Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, um, so the, another space-based um, platform that's giving you information over the oceans, at least, where the reflectivity is a little bit more constant and less, uh, about the presence of aerosols in the atmosphere. And so again, your warm colors, the bright red colors, are where you have uh, the most uh, column density of aerosols between the surface and the satellite. Um, so a quick snapshot of, of Eros. Um, just over the past 18 years, I think uh, we started our first cruise in 2004. Our most recent cruise was uh, just completed in December. So we've actually gone out in 2021 and in uh, 2020, a much reduced um, mission where we were doing primary sampling along at, or at the locations of some moored uh, buoys in the ocean. Um, but we've maintained a number of the measurements, um, trained 61 students in shipboard measurements, and that's both atmospheric and oceanographic measurements. 70% of the students trained from underrepresented groups hosted an additional 20 international scientists and publications and presentations uh, ongoing for this. Most of the presentations um, sort of focused in on our, our primary um, satellite CalVal improved retrievals, improvements to uh, NOAA models. Excuse me, but also uh, a number of publications on uh, aerosol microphysics and how the cloud properties have changed, precipitation properties, and beginning to show some on the chemistry uh, coming up. Um, and so the cruise tracks, um, I just throw this as a snapshot, um, uh, carve out predominantly the same swath across uh, the tropical Atlantic. We tend to move from uh, the Caribbean or Eastern seaboard um, out to the um, mid-Atlantic, about 20 north and move across at 20 north. Um, we hit a station at 23 west and more or less go south uh, from 23 west down to about three south and then either retrace that and return or deadhead uh, back, depending on uh, if we run into systems or not, uh, back to the Caribbean or to the Eastern seaboard. And so if the colors are showing up, um, sort of your average cruise track looks like this August 9 or the green cruise track where we um, start from the Caribbean, head out. And along this track, we're actually servicing some moored uh, boys. And so there's one that's about 37 west that we stop at. So we do a station, an oceanographic station at about 37 west. Another one at 20, 23. We go down along the 23 line uh, down south, and then typically we'll come up and return back. And so along each of these legs from west to east, from north to south or south to north, and from um, east back to west, forming slightly different types of experiments. Um, as we move from west to east and a storm uh, or a dust system is coming our way, as we sample, as we measure, we are sort of doing reverse measurements in time of the dust. So we're moving from aged dust uh, to more uh, nascent or younger dusts chemically uh, as we do that. As we go from north to south, south to north, we're doing cross sections of the air masses coming off of the coastline, which gives us a little bit different information, but along 23 west. And then when we move back, we're actually moving more or less at the same rate as the air masses, the, the Saharan air layer. And so we almost have 
sort of a semi-Lagrangian experiment as we go back. We're, we're measuring the changes in the air mass as the air mass evolves. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about the measurements, I think. Oh, this is just a quick snapshot of, uh, of uh, how do we know that there is fire? If you look from satellite, how do you distinguish between biomass smoke, which is very different from uh, dust? And it's difficult to do, but there are some hot spots that can be identified. Those are the red pixelated uh, regions. But as we measure, um, you know, the, it's very distinctive uh, on some of our devices, black carbon from the reddish or yellow or brownish um, dust, as well as the size distribution. So we have aerosol sizers, aerosol spectrometers that allow us to see, determine size distribution and the differences and dynamics of the, the size distribution, uh, the mass distribution, as well as collect uh, size segregated samples that we can analyze chemically. And so we can reconstruct the chemistry of the plume at different points along the trajectory. Um, and the dust storms are pretty significant, um, amazingly so for us. We'd seen them from space, but it wasn't clear what it would look like if you're at the ocean surface. Um, it's large enough to displace uh, locusts and insects, um, not just off the coast of Africa, but really at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And so we, we are seeing things at 37, 40, uh, 30 uh, west uh, at some cases. And for some of the dust storms, um, and that's just a picture of one of the air filters uh, in, of the ship, the external air filters of the ship. But for our first dust storm, we were uh, fortunate enough that you could collect dust by standing on the deck of the ship and holding out your hands. It would accumulate in your palms. That's how heavy the dust was. And I think I have a, a slide coming up. I'll show you what location that was. We were not at the coastline of, of Africa. Um, visibly, what do you see? Um, this is uh, a contrast of the typical blue sky day. Um, here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but that's uh, a comparable image of the ship actually from the O2 deck. So it's looking down across the top of the trailer forward towards the mast. It's a typical blue sky day. And this is a dusty day uh, where your visibility has dropped uh, to 20, 30 meters from the ship. Uh, it also shows a, a number of our radiative sensors that we uh, routinely take on the ship. I think the next slide, next slide is the air masses, but I'll come to a slide uh, shortly that has the routine measurements that we take. So performing these experiments over a long, uh, large number of years allows us to begin to move away from a case study analysis and into a semi sort of climatological analysis. We can look at a number of, um, we can classify all of the air masses that we've engaged with and then start to look at the chemistry, microphysics, cloud impacts, radiative forcing, as a function of air mass type. And those air masses can be extreme dust events, dust smoke um, mixtures, where you might be light dust, heavy biomass burning aerosol, or vice versa, or you know, predominantly biomass burning aerosol. Um, there have been cases where some of the African megacities have contributed very significantly to the air masses and looked at some of those um, unique chemistries. And so, we wanted to build up a database that we could then mine uh, for a number of different possibilities and provide parameterizations that we can then use to improve satellite retrievals, improve the satellite validation um, mission of arrows. Um, and so, sorry. Uh, so uh, arrows has three primary uh, goals uh, to uh, characterize atmospheric life cycle, to investigate the uh, atmospheric thermodynamics uh, and chemical processes, and then the satellite cal valve. Uh, and here's a quick snapshot of the measurements that we take. Uh, most recently, measurements are down here at the bottom for the last 10 years. We, we launch ozone sondes, so we have profiling measurements. We launch radio sondes and ozone sondes at least four a day. 
Um, we have an infrared spectrometer, the MARI, um, that's upward looking and downward looking to give us information on uh, skin temperature as well as composition. Uh, a sun photometer, which gives us optical depth measurements, a uh, suite of radiative measurements, a suite of uh, aerosol measurements that allow us to get aerosol number and mass density, as well as aerosol sampling, and then a suite of trace gas measurements focused on ozone, but also sulfate, uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Um, check my, how much time do I have? Uh, you're fine, it's 4.10, we typically run until about 4.30. Okay, good. So I've got at least an hour to go, so. Uh, uh, well, how about that? <laughs> 20 minutes. No, no I'm, I, I'm coming up on uh, my wrap up, but I want to summarize some of the findings from the mission. So we designed a seagoing mission that has a number of uh, different types of measurements um, where we are sampling, um, we are profiling the atmosphere, and we're also taking monitoring measurements within the marine boundary layer. And we're able to stitch these back together in such a way that we can, uh, we have been able to um, report some, I think, significant findings in terms of mineral dust uh, energy transfer or its influences on energy transfer. It turned out to be much larger than previously documented, and we've been able to uh, improve satellite uh, retrievals, uh, operational satellite retrievals for NOAA, as well as uh, import some of these parameterizations into global climate models. Um, there's a couple of publications listed there for that. Um, it definitely inhibits uh, mixing over the ocean. I'll show you some uh, of those uh, images that we've been able to put together to show the stability of the Saharan air layer and some of the first characterization of the full extent of the air, Saharan air layer. Uh, and then I talk a little bit about the enhancement of ice nuclei formation that depends on cloud type that we've also been able to see. An implication of that. Uh, is that it actually can lead to reduction in rainfall, uh, which we can tie to climate uh, and precipitation patterns in the Caribbean as well as West Africa. So the satellite CalVal um, focused on whoop, focused on whoop, uh, satellite of NOAA-based products. Uh, they were the primary uh, funder in this case to. Uh, develop correlative data sets, and that is going into the remote ocean, taking measurements where we don't have a uh, high uh, degree of measurements, um, where we can characterize the satellite overpasses with sort of minimum influences of uh, urban and surface uh, sources of aerosols and pollutants, uh, and then extract out uh, or find ways of extracting out the dust signal, which we know is there and also building. Uh, and so we um, combine our launches with uh, operational launches along the coastline of Africa, um, along the coastlines uh, or stations in the uh, Caribbean and Eastern seaboard and have been able to um, contribute a data set that allows us to better understand and improve the satellite retrievals. And so this is just a snapshot of how many launches, we've about a thousand uh, radio sons launched uh, to date. We launch about 70 to 80, depending on the crews, uh, but as well as ozone sons. And one of the things that we're beginning to see that uh, was not evident from satellite, uh, only beginning to be evident from satellite, but not predicted by a lot of models, or these stratospheric injections, coupling between the stratosphere and troposphere, um, actually in the tropics and low subtropical latitudes. Uh, and we think these are actually being driven by some of the dynamics of the uh, Saharan air layer. Um, we launch, you know, radio sons are balloon-borne uh, devices. I think this will play, and this is just an example of what it um, feels like to launch a balloon. Those are three uh, students. All of you, I think, now got their PhDs, um, published papers as part of this work, which is, is part of the mentoring model that we have, is that it's not just a, an opportunity to go to sea, but it's an opportunity to produce publishable research. Um, 
And so that was a close call, actually closer than it should have been to that A-frame, but um, a relatively safe uh, launch relative to many launches at sea. But what those launches allow us to do, uh, if you launch enough of those, and on, on this particular figure, those individual circles that you see along the, the base uh, lower axis of this graph are the individual sons. Um, each of those provides us with a profile of pressure, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and direction. And so this plot is pretty rich. Um, apologize for the density of it, but you have uh, relative humidity as a function of pressure altitude um, with wind barbs um, along each transect or leg of a particular cruise. And so going from west to east, you can basically carve out um, when your humidity drops off, you're basically looking at the shape and vertical structure of the Saharan air layer, which dries you down almost to the surface as it moves out. Uh, as it moves further across the Atlantic Ocean, it lifts just a little bit, but you can see that it has a really strong, persistent dry layer uh, actually throughout. As we turn to go north to south, you can also see um, both in the wind speed and direction, uh, as well as the uh, vertical structure, and moisture structure show the shape and dimensions, spatial dimensions of the Saharan air layer. And then on the return, you see the recedence uh, of that layer is sort of gone away and you see the moisture moving back up into the atmosphere. And you know these dust flows are um, pretty significant, but had not been characterized to this extent, uh, the spatial extent uh, until the cruises. And so we were able to use this data set uh, to really improve our understanding of what's happening in the tropics during uh, a Saharan air layer event, whether it's dusty or not, because every air mass uh, that comes off of the Sahara, they all tend to be dry, but they don't all tend to be uh, dust laden. And so there's significant differences in the forcing, in the thermodynamics sometimes, uh, depending on where that is. And so this uh, is a north-south leg, um, but just showing that if you move from the uh, lower tropics where you're in the intertropical convergence zone, you've got a lot of cloud and convective behavior. You've got moisture uh, up to uh, 250, 300 millibars. Um, but as soon as you leave that layer, if there's a Saharan air layer active, it's drying you again down to the surface and fairly persistent all the way up to about 20 degrees north. So it's extremely uh, dry uh, drying uh, influence over the tropical Atlantic. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we've been able to characterize air masses um, by using their optical uh, angstrom coefficient, uh, but using their optical properties to characterize air masses and air mass types. And again, this is something that we can use to build parameterizations to improve uh, satellite retrievals uh, in a way that if you look visibly, you see just aerosols that are moving off the coast of West Africa, but you can distinguish those based on select uh, wavelengths um, such that you can actually discriminate, even though you can't do it in the visible, but you can discriminate by wavelength ratios, what type of aerosols there are, and to some extent, the mixing between different types of aerosols. Um, and so those are some of the um, findings or outcomes of the um, Aero's cruise based on the physics. Uh, a summary, sort of a high level view of the findings based on chemical evolution I present here. And I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, uh, images from the, from the data. We have been able to clock the uh, aging process. Uh, it's about five to seven days for the chemistry to sort of lock into place and you don't see any more chemical evolution, at least uh, on the same time scale. Um, and then about three days for the microphysics, that is the, the size distribution is fairly dynamic for about three days and then it tends to evolve very slowly after that. 
Um, the mass distribution, which is a little bit different from the number distribution, also provides a number of insights. Um, and whether it's pure dust or uh, smoke, uh, biomass fire, uh, air masses. Uh, the iron coverage is different. There's a size dependence that we've been able to detect uh, in terms of the chemistry uh, of the aerosol. And the black carbon fraction, uh, we've been able to quantify uh, somewhat. We're still looking across the 18 years to see if that is good. We did a, an analysis of the first uh, sort of 10 years of the uh, cruises and the air masses that we were able to detect that were partly biomass burning. Uh, we've got another uh, eight years um, of data that we're starting to put in the same uh, analysis to really see if the, it holds up. But typically, um, black carbon uh, is a very, uh, is a smaller component, even when it is on the dust. Adhere to the dust is a very small component of the total mass. Um, and so some of the analysis, um, we know that we are mixing dust source regions. Um, and so we can detect by using back trajectory analysis at what point that we, at each point we sample where, what is the history of that air mass? And then correlate the mineralogy that we see to the source regions that are indicated by those trajectories. And so on these spaghetti plots, um, the red lines are basically um, the trajectory of the air that ended up at the square when we sampled. And so for each square, basically for the uh, eastward transect or cruise leg, the air was coming down along the coastline of Africa as we went from south, north to south, began to get more Saharan air. And then after a certain point, we were getting air from Gulf of Guinea or from uh, Central Africa. And so then we can look at our chemistries when we do this and sort of correlate those to aerosols that should be coming from those regions. Also look at the satellite imagery to confirm um, aerosol sources or aerosol optical depth at the same time. And then the lower trace uh, are just the trajectories, the air mass trajectories as we went from uh, south back up to north. And again, the behavior of the air masses um, similar, but actually different source regions on the return leg than when we first came down. And so this is just some of the data, some of the analysis that we use to separate what we should be seeing or, or explain what we are seeing. Um, and as we go through uh, any particular leg we're sampling, so we're taking snapshots, each of these red points, we're taking samples at each of those red points. Um, and we're taking, uh, what you see here are uh, electron micrographs of uh, examples of um, collections that were taken for this cruise track, uh, as well as uh, EDEX uh, results, uh, electron dispersive scattering for the different sizes. And so, you may not be able to, I'm not sure if this is resolvable, but the 0 0.5, 0 0.15, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 1 1.2, and 2.5 micron sized size fractions were sampled and then characterized using EDAX. And so the colored bar charts correspond to a particular sample and micrograph and location along the cruise track to show us or give us some indication of how the surface chemistry is evolving along the cruise track. Um, at the same time, we look at mass uh, distributions and size distributions. And so at different points, um, March um, four, six, seven, eight, um, we can uh, determine uh, what the size distribution is. And this actually is how we determine um, mass at different points in the uh, air mass in the south. So the dust storm has a different um, microphysical structure. If you're at the dust front, you're sort of in the middle of the dust plume where there's a lot more dynamics or you're at the, the edge of the dust plume, the trailing edge of the dust plume. Actually, pretty significant differences. 
Um, and there's effect on the chemistry as well. So we can measure along that same Coos track ozone. Um, red is the uh, highest ozone. Um, you see the higher ozone drop off as you get towards uh, in the most aged part of the dust and then pick back up uh, sort of in the newer dust. Uh, and we've actually been able to model this using some of the, the atmospheric chemistry models uh, to try to understand what the difference is in the ozone chemistry between the more nascent or new unaged dust and the more aged dust. Um, and at the same time we're taking those surface measurements, we are also doing profiling measurements. Uh, and this is where we're able to capture several um, stratospheric injection events um, that corresponded to uh, some of the dust uh, storms. Um, we do not, we have not completed this analysis. Actually, these came out of uh, sort of a post analysis of a recent cruise, I think a 2019 cruise, which we saw a lot of ozone that appeared to be coming down uh, from the upper atmosphere down towards the SAL. Um, and then actually went back through some of the data and found out that this was not an anomalous event, that we'd actually seen this before in certain cases and were able to go back and, and actually. Uh, look at vorticities and identify that there had actually been tropopause uh, folding event. Um, and the interesting thing here is that this typically is not expected to occur in the tropics. Um, typically a, a higher uh, latitude phenomenon. Um, and so uh, just to wrap up some of the, the outcomes and what are we doing now, um, still looking at uh, the climatology of the population dynamics of uh, the microphysics, but also of microbial communities on the aerosols. There's a lot of implications uh, as vehicles for uh, pathogen transport or whether you have free bacteria in the plumes or they're attached to the dust, um, whether those are um, correlated to health uh, when you see meningitis outbreaks or other sort of respiratory uh, asthma, uh, ailments or illness increases in the Caribbean uh, Eastern seaboard? Are they associated with the dust itself? Or are they associated with microbial communities on the dust or associated with the dust plume? And so we're going back, we've been collecting um, microbial samples for the last 10 years in a systematic way and, and starting to look at those uh, and a couple papers under review um, coming out about that. But we have identified viable fungi, which have cash crop implications. And I've got a slide coming up on that. Um, surface chemistry and chemical processing. Um, again, we're looking at the different classifications of the air mass types and trying to understand how chemistry is different as a function of air mass type. Um, number of emails since I got to ASU asking me about microplastics in Saharan dust. This is not something I've looked at, but we're going to share some of our samples and see if that there's a way to, to characterize or quantify how much Saharan dust or microplastics are in these dust episodes. Stratospheric intrusions uh, and folding events, I uh, talked a little bit about, and um, we have the ability to take some of the dust aerosol that we have and perform some nucleation experiments on them and compare nucleation properties of aged dust versus uh, younger dust, dust that we sampled far downstream from dust that we've sampled right off the coast of Africa or at some of the Muad array off the coast of Africa. So we're going to start those experiments uh, soon. Um, but these are some of the, the directions that we're going. But as I talk to people, there's always new uh, questions about the data. Um, I'm going to pass this slide because I thought I hit it, but it's just uh, if someone has a question, I'll come back to it. Um, cash crop, this is uh, just a quick look at um, what we've been able to determine uh, so far. Um, and these are one of the interests in looking at fungi or pathogens on Saharan dust was some coral reef deaths that were happening in the Caribbean that later turned out to be connected with. Um, ocean temperature increases rising uh, and less so to the pathogen. But viable pathogens were found in dust storms, uh, collected from airborne samples, collected upstream, middle of the ocean, 
And we expose those to several cash crops, uh, wheat, soy, uh, apple, um, and tomato, and found that there are several uh, species uh, that are carried on the dust storms or associated with dust storms that could threaten those cash crops, the most susceptible being wheat and soy. And so they come, uh, if you inoculate uh, the plants or, or, or uh, leaves with uh, the dust, just the dust itself, um, it causes lesions, uh, grows quite uh, rapidly. Uh, and some of this work is ongoing with the University of Maryland. I want to acknowledge before I go to the next, the mentoring model, part of this, uh, many of the students who work specifically in my group on this, I've got them patched in here um, from uh, different countries from coast to coast, uh, many different universities who helped out uh, on the ship, in the lab, uh, in the field on many of these studies. So I just want to acknowledge them going forward. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the mentoring model. It's embedded in what we do uh, for the next couple of slides and a few comments on inclusion. One of the things that we do in mentoring is that we are, we mentor in a way that takes the current reality um, into, brings it into focus. We don't treat it implicitly or any assumptions. We recognize explicitly that a common experience of many black scholars is that if you are too loud, you are too visible, um, if you're too oppositional, especially with presumed uh, uh, or, or favorite theories, uh, if you're too presumed to be too innovative uh, or non-conventional, there, there are penalties for that. And there are more rewards for being doing very safe science and more and assimilating, uh, which many times means erasing the individual. And there was a really interesting paper that came out uh, I think it was just last year, 2020, 2021, 2020, uh, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences called the Diversity Innovation Paradox. I really invite everyone to take a look at this. 30 year analysis of nearly all US PhD recipients in their dissertations found that demographically underrepresented students innovate at higher rates than majority students, but their novel contributions are discounted and less likely to earn them academic positions amazing that you are penalized for being innovative if you look a certain way. And so we take this into account. Um, we specifically counter approaches that say, just assimilate, don't be risky in your thoughts. Um, we avoid colorblind approaches um, because there is racism. And pretending like it doesn't exist is, is debilitating more than it is uplifting or enabling. And we encourage and support um, an understanding and competence that students of color are authorized to produce, curate, challenge, and possess, and create new knowledge, not just extend incrementally the science, but do things very differently. And I think this is critical. Um, and recognizing the uniqueness in perspective and in approach uh, is, is how we build a much more inclusive geoscience community. I put two uh, references at the top, Critical Mentoring uh, and We Want to Do More Than Survive by Bettina Love. These are reasonably recent uh, publications of books, um, but I strongly consider um, strongly advocate uh, reading sections or parts of these books as you bring in scholars of color, um, scholars who may not be fit the conventional mold uh, in thought or action, um, because I think it's we're missing out on some really innovative science when we force people to assimilate and erase themselves. So our model sort of pushes back, not sort of, our model pushes back against that. And I think that's why so many of the students have been successful. A couple of key elements, um, I think it's called mosaic mentoring now, we've called it team mentoring, in that 
um, while we're on the ship, before we get on the ship, after we leave the ship, uh, students have a team of mentors that they regularly meet up with. Sometimes in the one-on-one, -on -one, but on the ship, we meet as groups and one-on-one, -on -one, and they have mentoring beyond the core team based on what their interests are. Uh, we make sure that they're connected to a network of folks who can support them based on what their needs. And we select mentors in a very discriminating way, again, based on the skills that they have, must be good listeners, must be strong in observational skills, because a lot of times students won't tell you when things first start to fall apart or something has happened. Um, and it has to be uh, an active openness to learning from the students. And these are part of the interview process that we have for all of our, our mentors. We do have a lot of returning mentors, so we've been able to um, have mentors teach other mentors or talk to other mentors about this as they come along. Um, we assign mentors to mentees based on the needs of the mentee. So there's no randomness in the assignments. Uh, and this comes out of discussions with the prior mentors of the students, as well as with the students. Where they wanna go, where they wanna do, where their interests, and also what are their personality types and what are their struggles, what are their challenges? And then we try to do our best uh, to build a group um, of mentors that can support them because there's no one person can support all the needs of any individual. Um, we have a very direct and consistent response to harassment and bias. Unfortunately, geosciences, field work in geosciences, uh, harassment in the field is epidemic. Um, and so we have the pre-orientation for all members, sorry for that typo, um, but we have regular check-ins with the commanding officer and uh, the executive officer on the ship. Um, we have an immediate response. If anything is reported, if anything is seen, we ask that all the mentors remain highly vigilant um, to see if there's any change in behavior um, amongst the students, amongst any of the crew, how they interact with the students, um, amongst other mentors. So we're, you have to remain vigilant uh, because everything that happens, you may not see, even on a ship where it's really close quarters and, and you're able to see a lot of things. Um, and there have been cases where we have gone to the CO and said, when we get to port, uh, we're not getting back on the ship unless this happens, this person is removed, uh, or this person has to you know, be separated from our team at all times. Um, and, and those are very uncomfortable situations. They're not fun, I should say, but um, it builds confidence if you react immediately, swiftly, and decisively. Um, and so we have a zero tolerance uh, on harassment and bias, and that extends throughout. Um, and finally, relational mentoring. Um, we have community engagements in every port that we go to where we seek to um, provide exposure to our science, uh, to role models that we have on the ship with, uh, with students uh, in the ports especially students who might not have be from the highest socioeconomic class or the best schools. We have cultural engagements, um, strong relationship with the uh, University of Puerto Rico. So we always have Puerto Rican students on the ship. Salsa is a cultural engagement, but we don't do it at night. We do it during the day. We have teachers. Um, we have a limited and you know, monitored engagement. Uh, we have musical exchange uh, among students and crew and uh, science team. Uh, we make sure our science is accessible um, in port, as I said, but also on the ship. We schedule our weather briefing so that everybody can attend who wants to attend. We schedule science talks for the crew uh, and officers, uh, as well as for our team, and make sure that it's at a level that everybody can understand. Uh, we have book shares between mentors and mentees. Uh, it's part of some of the interview process. We find out what they like to read if they're reading bring books, share books, have book discussions. These aren't necessarily technical books, they just may be books that we've enjoyed. And so there's a rich uh, experience there beyond the science, beyond the professionalization uh, that is really rewarding. And I think if you look at the top picture here, you might just see a bunch of brown folks, but you've got African-Americans, Cuban-Americans, Trinidadian-Americans, Puerto Ricans, folks from the South, folks from the North, um, all of these folks now have gotten PhDs, they're faculty 
uh, here, two, two of these folks are now faculty, uh, a couple work for the uh, federal government, actually, uh, uh, yeah, a couple work for the federal government, federal labs, Los Alamos, uh, used to be JPL, uh, now at University of Wisconsin faculty. Um, a couple work for NOAA. Uh, so they've gone on from these experiences and become very successful. Uh, and I think it's because we have armed them with what they need to both be themselves as well as be successful, understand the science as well as understand the landscape of the scientific community. And so I'll wrap up with some challenges. Um, quite often your choice, and this goes back to this innovation diversity paradox, as well as just the, the tacit assimilation that's so often uh, present in sort of standard uh, mentoring in a field that is, is not very diverse, um, it may be easier if, it may seem easier for other scientists, it's not just black scientists, but any scientists that may look different, may signal a difference from visible cues. Um, it may seem easier to just assimilate and don't call out or react to microaggressions, internalize those. Um, don't resist or ask questions that might seem too far-fetched because they won't be accepted. And this is precisely where allies are required for change. I, this is where it, it is a we problem and it's not on the marginalized shoulders to change everything. This is where the partnerships can really be effective. If allies speak up when there are microaggressions and police those themselves. Police the microaggressions, not the marginalized. Um, acceptance of individuality and, and, and affirmation of individuality as a resource versus a threat to standards. Um, cultural competence, um, I often say that cultural competence is the difference between good intentions and good results. I believe that there are some wonderful people in science and reading is good, reading is fundamental, um, but cultural competence is more than just reading materials and discussing those materials. It is really about unlearning and, and focusing on unlearning things that may get in your way as much as it is learning. Um, growth, you know, equity and inclusion work is ongoing work. It doesn't stop. It's a, it's a part of social growth. And so it's a process. And we have to be realistic about the process. None of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. I have, I have things that I learn all the time from international students that are biases that I have ingrained and, you know, need to offset. Um, you know, different students can teach Students who appear different can teach so much, and we have to sort of welcome uh, that opportunity to learn. Uh, and I think decentering self identity when it comes to these conversations, it's not about personal good goodness, it's about equity. And those are two really different things. And I think that's a challenge for a number of us. Um, you know, and that's some of the work of unlearning is that when am I, as a mentor, putting myself in the center versus the student and their welfare in the center. So just a couple of takeaways and then I'll say thanks. Um, racism is still here and it's entrenched uh, in ways that are both visceral, invisible sometimes, but existential uh, to those who feel it. And the other isms always detract from the humane service of science. And you know, representation won't get better without really decisive intentional action. It's not just going to get better because of incremental change. It just, it is, isn't. Um, and we've got to be better informed, better connected, um, willing to participate in difficult discussions um, and listening to students, uh, you know, listening to students, but implementing as leaders and using our levers of influence uh, across the spectrum of this academic hierarchy that, we, that we're all embedded in. Um, the picture here is 
little bit of history, Library of Congress, I was bused to school. I was actually went to kindergarten, first grade in Japan. My first experience in an American, in a US school, looked exactly like this uh, with my sister. And so when I found this picture, it really resonated with me what going to school was like, just the distant look in this young man's eyes as he was like, man, I can't go to school with my friends. I gotta get on this bus. I gotta go to take a bus to my school, get on another bus, and then I gotta go to this classroom where nobody calls on me. And so when I talk about oppositional behavior in school, it gets driven by things like this. Um, unfortunately, my mother was a teacher and a principal, so I had to, I still had to bring home A's even if I was gonna sort of be a little jerk in class. Um, thanks uh, to everybody. I really hope that this provokes some thoughts and questions and, and conversation that we that will be ongoing. Um, but I do want to thank the folks who gave uh, a lot of money to keep these uh, cruises going and the work in the labs going and the analysis. Um, so NASA through a couple of cooperative agreements, National Institutes of Health on the bio uh, aerobiology uh, work and some of the ongoing health work um, as it affects uh, differential effects in different populations. And uh, I think that is it. Thank you for that um, very comprehensive and broad presentation. Um, um, so I'm looking at the time. We're a little long, and I'm mindful of the fact that uh, I put this in the chat a couple of times. Uh, students who are taking this class for credit, claiming the colloquium is a part of the class for credit, need to stay after a little bit to have a conversation with Professor Busick. Um, so I'm going to ask, are there any like really burning questions? We can take maybe one or two burning questions. I see. There's one or two in the Q and A um, that are um, that are interesting, but I don't know if they are worth staying late. Um, Rachel Adam has a question. Um, why don't we do this one, okay? Because I think what you talked about at the end of the talk was really quite profound and important. Um, Rachel Adam asks, how do allies better inform themselves on the efforts needed to help BIPOC? without placing the responsibility and pressure on the underrepresented communities to relay their needs. And just before you answer that, just to stress again, that, that those taking this class, taking the clothing for credit, please stay after a few minutes. We're gonna answer this one question and then we'll turn it over to Professor Busick to talk with you about, about the class. But we wanna take at least one important question. So go ahead, Vernon. Okay, yeah, and I apologize for going, I was trying to keep one eye on the clock. Apologize for- A lot of good stuff to talk about. Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, this is where some of the, I think it's two parts. One part is, uh, I think as the urge uh, consortium and some of the conversation groups are doing is to um, look at the literature, the wealth of literature uh, out there that is, that is, can be very clarifying. Um, but one of the things to do is engage not just the um, BIPOC scholars who are in geosciences because they're, or STEM, they tend to be few and they tend to get overwhelmed, but there are folks who are critical race theorists on campus, uh, the School of Social Transformation, people who um, look at organizational dynamics in the schools of business and management and sort of broaden the scope of people that you might tap for their expertise uh, so that you're not overwhelming one particular group that you know is underrepresented. So I think you do want to reach out and sort of form or develop authentic conversations, but broaden, broaden the scope uh, so that there's not this laser focus on the one BIPOC person who's in the, in the unit. All right. Uh, with that, I think we'll uh, let you go. Um, and uh, again, um, thanks for a really broad and stimulating talk. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like, I, 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 and I suspect I'm not the only one would love to have you back in some capacity to talk more about some of these issues. Um, the issues we talk about a lot in CC and some of us are doing various things on the side. Um, you're unique, uh, you have a unique perspective to, to offer and that we can learn from. So hope we can find a way to do that. Most definitely, I look forward to uh, dropping by. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Tempe on Tuesdays, so perhaps I can, I can catch some folks offline on, on Tuesdays as we go forward. Great. Beyond the surge. Well, thank you again very much. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to promote Peter Busick to panelist now so that he can talk to the students taking looking for credit. Um, so I'm they can get out of here. Recording. Oh, and yeah, stop recording.